Okay, we are live today with the Valentine's Day Horse Special of Bring History, A Traveler's Guide. I am your host, Greg Denham, and with me today, I have some different co-hosts on as for today's special. On one pan one side of the cali, we have Mike Fredericks, the editor of Prehistoric Times. And what other... up? <laughs> Hi, Mike. And on the other side of the pond, we have the fine Irishman, Sean Markey, the writer for GeekIreland.com, and Ireland's biggest dinosaur enthusiast. All right. Hey, nice to meet you guys. <laughs> and for our guest of honor today, we are interviewing the author of an amazing work of recent paleo fiction set during the, one of the bloodiest conflicts of recent history, the Vietnam War. The book is titled Primitive War, and its author is Mr. Ethan Pettis. Welcome to the podcast, Ethan. I'm also going to say, what up? <laughs> so, uh, Hope y'all are having a beautiful day. Yeah, getting up at 8.30 in the morning to record a show about dinosaurs tearing the crowd, tearing the tearing U.S. soldiers to shreds in the jungles of Vietnam. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, not just Americans. They're they're equal opportunists. They'll eat Russians. They'll eat Vietnamese. They just love eating people. They're, they're not specific. <laughs> yeah, true. yeah, just whatever whatever hairless primate they can get their talons into. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep, indeed. Now, anyhow, I think I'll start off my first question here. Is well, how did you get started with writing this book? Who were your main writing influences while putting together Primitive War? Like movies, video games, other forms of media? And more specifically, Mark Rabber wanted to know, what was the main inspiration for writing the novel Primitive War? So, there's a lot of answers to that question. Um, so, I came up with the idea for Primitive War when I was in high school. I was a member of the uh, Jurassic Park Legacy Forums, and I posted a writing prompt where people could fill out this character sheet and I would include them in a story that I was working on about soldiers fighting monsters and dinosaurs in Vietnam. Uh, sorry, I have to take my wiener dog out. Come on, girl. Sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, I was 16 when I came up with the original idea and I came up with it uh, because we were reading the things they carried by Tim O'Brien in high school. And Tim O'Brien just kind of blew my mind as far as, like, what writing could be because he was actually a Vietnam vet and he had written several memoirs about his experiences in Vietnam. And his style of prose just kind of took me off my feet, just how beautiful and evocative his writing could be while dealing with the morality of life and death and war and violence. So, I've always been deeply in love with dinosaurs, so after reading that book, I was getting much more interested in war and what war was, and that got me kind of crossing wires where dinosaurs just kind of naturally bled into Vietnam. I'd be in school drawing pictures of soldiers in Vietnam in the jungle, and I think, what's missing from this? All oh, right, need to put a velociraptor right there in the grass, or maybe a T-Rex looking in from the tree line. Because, I mean, with Vietnam, it wasn't like fighting in World War II or Korea, where it was all front lines battle. I mean, there was plenty of that in Vietnam against the North Vietnamese Army. But the thing that captured my attention the most about Vietnam was that you were taking people from the United States and dropping them into a place as far away and as unimaginable as Mars. Because you're taking people from the United States and putting them into a tropical environment of lush rainforests and mountains. And the enemy wasn't just you know, riding around in tanks, dive bombing you in planes. The NVA was, but the Viet Cong weren't. And that idea of the Viet Cong always being in the darkness, in the shadows of the forest, just kind of felt right for dinosaurs. I mean, what better way to describe how horrifying being lost in nature could be other than being eaten alive by a large animal native to that environment. 
my biggest inspirations as far as writing goes, uh, Michael Crichton was my biggest influence on my writing structure as far as like the slow buildup of mystery going towards the uh, science fiction aspect, using that as a ground to uh, build a foundation for this story about people and their struggles. As far as my inspirations for my writing style, my prose, my voice and my writing, that was definitely inspired by reading the likes of Tim O'Brien and Michael Crichton. I like Michael Crichton for his ability to like write short, punchy sentences, just one after the other, detailing everything that's happening in a situation as dry as possible. But I liked him about Brian's writing because of his fluidity with his prose and his ability to conjure up so many different emotions in a single paragraph. So those are my two biggest influences, I'd say. Uh, you can't have a better influence. Couldn't have a better influence than Michael Crichton. I mean, Jurassic Park really was the benchmark, the benchmark and the trendsetter for lots of works of modern paleo fiction, both in literature and in cinema and so forth. It feels like the only one. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, really, a lot of things are still. Some of the reconstructions of dinosaurs I see in popular culture are still influenced by Jurassic Park to an extent. Whereas in paleo fiction literature, the writers seem to be more ahead of the curve of updating their dinosaurs to reflect the current scientific understanding, as Ethan has done in Primitive War, for example. So what you're saying is if we want to see a bunch of uh, mainstream fettered velociraptor toys, we're going to need someone to make a movie of uh, Primitive War. I think that would definitely be okay. a good way. I think that would definitely be a good way to get the public to, you know, be more open to having them in their movies. I mean, they, there was that Dinosaur Island film, but that was, a, that was a that was a children's movie, and it didn't exactly get good reviews, from what I've heard. Yeah, I t yeah, yeah. I, I I've seen it myself. I reviewed it, and uh, I have to say, like, what well, like what held the movie back? It wasn't the dinosaur designs. It was just the fact that it wasn't a well. The, the story wasn't up to task. It was. Kind of made for kids. It was pretty low budget. The acting was quite ropey. So, I think uh, we need a. We don't just need any movie with like act with uh, I suppose up to date dinosaurs. I think we just need a really a killer, a, a great movie that will kind of wow people the way uh, Jurassic Park did ninety three. I mean, back then, you know, people still saw dinosaurs as these uh, slow tail draggers. So when uh, we saw these active, warm blooded animals running around screen, it was a total game changer. So I think. Here we are 25 years later, and I think Jurassic World, for all its good points, it still is kind of uh, just hitting up the nostalgia beats, reminding us of what uh, was good about Jurassic Park, but not kind of changing the game to kind of keep up with the, the modern interpretation of dinosaurs the way Jurassic Park did back in its day. So I'd be a little bit disappointed in, it in that respect, but I think... Uh, the next generation of uh, books and films, like like novels such as uh, Primitive War and this current generation, I think could really help uh, set a new trend, so to speak. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever see that in a Jurassic Park movie, though. Better mm -hmm. dinosaurs. They've already yeah. got their concepts down. They've got their... They know what people want to see, or at least they think they know what people want to see, which is their familiar, you know lizard-like dinosaurs with broken wrists and uh when i wrote the book uh i wanted to do what michael crichton did michael crichton wrote dinosaurs as what science currently understood them as so i wanted to carry that torch and help bring modern dinosaurs back into you know culture but it's just a matter of getting it to the point where everybody can see a feathered dinosaur and recognize it as a dinosaur and still think, wow, a dinosaur, look at that, it's amazing, instead of just looking at it and saying, oh, it's just a feathered bird. That's just a lizard with feathers. Hmm. Yeah. This is a question, another question from Mark Raburn asked, which I'm going to jump ahead to here, is you made feathered dinosaurs scary. When people complain that feathered dinosaurs are scary, I'll how did you manage to achieve that theme of making your feathered dinosaurs both terrifying and intimidating? Well, I'd say for the uh, three biggest ones, it'd be Deinonychus, Utah Raptor, and Tyrannosaurus Rex. T Rex was easy because it's a 16 foot tall, 40 foot long behemoth. So 
it's kind of hard not to make that scary, even if you put feathers on it. So I wanted to have it uh, not fully feathered, but just having the mane and the crest is enough to uh, extenuate the design of the animal. And the idea of it having a mane was kind of inspired by how uh, male lions have manes. And since tyrannosaurs were known to bite each other and fight before mating, I thought having a mane would probably assist in T-Rex in not getting his throat torn open. Uh, for Deinonychus, I went with the, uh, the recent research papers that were putting forth the idea that Deinonychus could have been arboreal as in, like, living in trees and hunting from the treetops. And it's hard to imagine a Velociraptor or Deinonychus is scary if it's completely feathered, but if it's jumping down from the treetops and ripping open the throats of Stiggy Moloch and actively pursuing the main characters through the forest, it brings a little bit more terror into the situation. Because you could look at a bobcat or a coyote and say, oh, that's just a dog, that's just a cat. But if it's got teeth and claws and it's on top of you and it's going for your throat, you're going to be afraid no matter what. <laughs> and for Utah Raptor, that was the easiest of all because I wanted them to be ambush predators. I wanted them to personify that fear I was talking about before, that fear of what's lying in wait in the forest where you can't see what's watching you from the shadows. So having the Utah Raptors using their feathers as, you know, camouflage felt like the perfect way to bring that horror into the animal itself. Because then, if you're reading the book through the eyes of the characters, you never know when a Utah Raptor might show up. The only sign is when things get quiet. Yeah, the, every sequence with the Utah Raptors were stalking Vulture Squad or other human characters. It reminded me very much of the Predator movies set in jungle environments and predator stories in general where it's an isolated area and you have a small team, small group of human characters being systematically hunted and eliminated by the alien hunters. Yeah, predator was a huge influence because, I mean, you have like Turok and you have Alien and you have all these movies where it's like space marines or soldiers encountering otherworldly monsters and exotic environments. So Predator was a huge influence on that, and the original form of primitive war that was available on Jurassic Park Legacy was much more inspired by Predator because I wanted to get that like whole gung-ho action, soldiers beating the crap out of big intimidating monsters. But as I did more research into Vietnam, and as I read more about the Vietnam War, that idea of having action heroes and having soldiers that were immune to every danger they faced no longer entertained me. I wanted to make that fear and that knowledge of anybody can go at any moment, I wanted that to be palpable. So I kind of strayed away from the Predator influences and went more towards the platoon and influences at that point in the writing. Yeah, I think I caught on some I caught on some of that when I was reading the book that the movie that film Splatoon and Apocalypse now had some influence in the way you structured the story and the characters and how the experiences of war affect them both on a physical and a, on a psychological level. Yeah, Apocalypse Now is a great movie. Um, Apocalypse Now actually influenced the uh, sequel more because Apocalypse Now was directly inspired by Heart of Darkness. And my second book in the Primitive War series is kind of my own interpretation of Heart of Darkness and Apocalypse Now in that idea of people going on a journey that only destroys them in the end. A more uh, nihilistic approach to storytelling. Said for in paleo fiction, there's a, there's something for everybody. That's all I can say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to read a book about dinosaurs where people deal with PTSD and schizophrenia and addiction. But I wanted to 
be true to the times and be true to what that world was at the time. Well, I'll tell you what, I think that's a, it's a perfectly legitimate angle because when you think about it, if you got lost in the jungle and were pursued by dinosaurs and saw a lot of your buddies getting massacred in horrific ways, I mean, and not to mention the whole uh, being terrorized by uh, other humans as well in the forms of soldiers from uh, rival nations. But, you know, if you got thrown into the mix with dinosaurs and saw some disembowelments and had this horrible feeling of being stalked for days and not knowing when you were just going to be uh, pulled away into bushes and massacred, I mean, of course you'd get, uh, you'd be traumatized. You know, that's something like, um, I think the only Jurassic Park film so far to even slightly deal with the idea was uh, Jurassic Park 3 of all places where Grant just had a nightmare about a, a ridiculous nightmare about a velociraptor but um, other than that you know that's something that's really untouched uh, in the mainstream so you know I mean we, we like to think of dinosaurs as being fun and for kids almost but if we met them for real, real life uh, I don't think uh, we'd come out well I think it'd be a pretty horrific experience well especially the predatory ones anyway Absolutely. This might be kind of... Sorry, I uh, hope I'm not interrupting. Um, I was going to say something kind of meta about the writing of Primitive War was that looking at where I was when I was writing it, when I came up with the idea, I was about 16 years old, but when I actually started writing the uh, current novel, I was 19, and I finished it when I was 21. Uh, you have this idea of postmodern writing, which is where it's no longer man versus man or man versus self. It's man versus the future, man versus reality. Uh, I mean, you can kind of see it in The Last Jedi. Uh, a lot of movies that have come out in the past decade, two decades, have kind of done away with the traditional idea of storytelling in favor of doing something more adult and more adult oriented and I didn't really see that with Jurassic Park um, one of the main inspirations for writing Primitive War was the Lost World and how in the Lost World you the hunting party that runs through the long grass don't go into the long grass and they get slaughtered left and right but you have no impact from that that's the thing about Jurassic Park is that even if a character you like dies, and this goes for the books as well, you don't really get their experience. You don't really get any kind of emotional impact from their death. It's just another stock character gone. You never really get to see what death is to those characters or see what it means to be alive in those characters. So I was... Kind of wanting to write a Jurassic Park for adults. I mean, I'm not going to say that Primitive War isn't suitable for teenagers because, I mean, if I was 13 and I found Primitive War, I would have picked it up immediately. Uh, I think it's a more grim look at a world with dinosaurs than you would get from Jurassic Park, but I felt like I kind of owed it to you know, the older generations, the people that grew up on Jurassic Park and were no longer, you know, getting that emotional resonance from it. I know that a lot of paleo fans are super excited for Fallen Kingdom, but honestly, like Jurassic World and from what I've seen of Fallen Kingdom, I feel like it's not really going to get me on any kind of emotional level. So something that I try to do with my writing is I want to get people on an emotional level. I want to get them... You know, if you're an adult or if you're a teenager picking up the book for the first time, I want you to feel something when you read it. I don't want you to just go through it and at the end of it say, that was a cool adventure. I want you to read it and, you know, experience it, feel it. And that's the thing I really, that's the thing that really gave me, that was one of the big reasons I gave Primitive War the five-star rating I did on Amazon, because you actually made these people real human beings about them being, you know, your stereotype cliche characters. I mean, like Game of Thrones, anybody can die at any point in the story. There's no red shirts in this book. <laughs> well, except, mm -hmm. for, except for unnamed characters, that is. Any of the named characters, when they die, their deaths actually serve a purpose in the plot, and they actually affect the other characters, realistically, and thus the reader by proxy. 
I would hope so. <laughs> well, it, for me, it definitely did. Especially, I think the, the one that does that, the first death that really like shook me was in Chapter 19, Ascension. Tolstoy being torn apart by the cuts of Kowatlas. Yeah, that one, uh, I really wanted to get visceral and get raw, raw with the, uh, the experience of the characters in that chapter because they're just crawling prone through a floodplain, just shouldering through elephant grass that reaches up over their heads, halfway buried in puddles of bedded water. Uh, I wanted to capture that that setting, that experience, and the shadows going over their bodies as these unfamiliar titans fly through the sky overhead and then once they actually land and the attack starts it's about as horrific as if you were in the same situation and a bomb went off or bullets started flying it's that same amount of visceral impact of we're in an unfamiliar area we're crawling through leech infested swamp land and now one of our closest friends is getting his... There are holes being punched through his body. He's losing limbs. It's no different than if you were to be in a combat situation, except in this case, it's a 20-foot-tall uh, pterosaur doing the damage. But does not make the impact on the reader or does it make the impact on the character himself or the other characters? Does not make it any less it being an animal than being another person with a gun. I wanted I wanted to have that kind of punch. Something that you can look at it and read it and it doesn't matter if it's man or beast that's doing the act, it's gonna hit you the same way. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Now I had I had a question about an uh, attribute that cuts a cutlass in the book. Where did the idea for the barbed tongue come from exactly i know you've stated to me in the in the past that it wasn't the woodpecker's tongue that inspired was there some other animal that inspired your creative choice to have the katakotlas have these uh, very strong tongues with hooks on them so that was inspired by three different things uh this paleo artist uh tila kovacs he's from europe i believe he did a black and white pencil sketch of a Quetzalcoatlus with a tongue with bristles on the end of it. And I like that idea of having the bristled tongue. But uh, have you ever seen The Mist by Stephen King? Oh, yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a creepy one. Mm -hmm. uh, you have that tentacle monster in it with the, uh, the clawed end of the tongue. I wanted... I remember how visceral and intense that was watching it for the first time when that tentacle comes out of the mist and wraps around that poor kid's leg and just tears off a chunk of his kneecap uh it was also because you know if you look at parrots and how parrots use their tongues as, as prehensile uh appendages similar to uh elephant uses its trunk um if you look at a quetzalcoatlus and just see it as a big stork. Eh, it's kind of cool. It's a really giant uh, pterosaur, but if that pterosaur can uh, manipulate its prey with its tongue, then that just adds a grotesque aspect to the creature itself. And honestly, just imagining Quetzalcoatlus as it was, it is an absolutely grotesque animal, especially if you were to encounter one in the wild. I'm sure they would be beautiful flying, but if you have a 20-foot-tall uh, pterosaur with, you know, skin hanging down around its neck, a big pelican gullet, and a beak that's been sharpened from punching in and out of its prey, and breaking through bones and you have that long tongue reaching out into the grass trying to feel its way around your leg that's that's the making of a good movie monster not to say that I was trying to make the animal itself into a monster but through the eyes of the characters in the book 
it's definitely one of the most hellish animals you could ever come across. <laughs> yeah, I have to commend you on the choice of Quetzalcoatlus there and how that, well, not just the choice, but how they were portrayed because um, I don't, I really don't think there's any animal like on the fossil record that looks so alien and just threatening. You know, if you look at it, like you said, it's a 20 foot tall flying creature with wings that are it like to our to our eyes it, it shouldn't be able to fly but it can it, it just looks like something it looks like an alien and uh yeah like, uh, every kinda... every sorry uh, like, like just, I was they gonna... kind of swoop sorry sorry they just kind of swoop in and <laughs> appear like something like these guys are already living through a nightmare and then just when how can this get much worse? These almost literal nightmare creatures that defy belief just emerge from out of nowhere. And, well, as we know, the rest they say is history. Um, so for you, uh, Sean and Mike, were there any specific deaths that hit you harder than Tolstoy's death? Um, I'll tell you what, uh, there was one particular, and I think it was... Uh, not so much the debt in that it was the description. There was a, a one of the earlier appearances of the Utah Raptors where they've captured one of the U.S. Well, it's it's kind of attacking one of the U.S. soldiers, and it comes back to you were talking about how the camouflage feathers for camouflage. It kind of envelops the poor guy in its under its kind of I suppose wings, for lack of a better word, and kind of crouches down over the guy while the <laughs> other guys are running around looking for him. And I just think that's a terrible. I. I talk about the most terrifying uh, experience you could have while well, you're being held down by this this gro this monstrosity while well, your help is so close and yet so far i just think that was a like talk about making feathers scary like literally it's using its feathers to do this heinous thing i just thought that was just horrific, but, but brilliant yeah uh, ethan uh, like i told you um the russian guy near the end of the book that gets uh torn apart by the little baby Utah Raptor for some reason it really got to me too the, just the yeah, dead that was, of those guys <laughs> yeah that was a, that was a Crichton callback because usually at the end of Crichton's novels the uh, the main human antagonist so John Hammond or uh, oh man what was his name uh, Dodgson. Dodgson yeah yeah Dodgson yeah. Oh man, that's bad. <laughs> if I can't remember a name from Jurassic Park, that means something bad's going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, Dogson and Hammond, their deaths in Jurassic Park and The Lost World, uh, respectively. Uh, it's just kind of like a come up, and it's like the one that started all the problems to begin with always gets the worst death at the end of the book, and I couldn't think of a worse death than being eaten alive from the inside out by baby Utah raptors. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a slow that. death. A slow death. Mm -hmm. mm. Slow and agonizing. <laughs> also, it also reminded me of the ending of the Carnosaur book where the, the wife of the lead villain was also eaten alive by a trio of baby tyrannosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I never read Carnosaur. I keep hearing good, good things about it. Ethan, um, why did you choose the dinosaurs you chose in the book. I mean, <clears throat> I know uh, duckbill <laughs> dinosaurs wouldn't be too exciting. They'd probably run away from the soldiers. But uh, mm -hmm. I like the fact that they're all Cretaceous. They may not all have lived in the same place at the same time, but we won't go there. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. yeah, that was uh, that was one thing I wanted to do is to have the consistency of at least like have a general time period for all the animals to come from. Uh, I know in the book it discusses the idea that the animals came from different time periods in, you know, history and from different environments and landscapes entirely, but that will be explored more uh, in the next two novels. I'm going to start uh, including animals that are from the uh, countries that they appear in, so I, you know, you have Africa, you could have Carker, Dontosaurus, and Spinosaurus show up. Good, good. As, yeah, as far as the uh, choices for the animals, I went through a lot of different iterations. So originally, uh, you know how there's the Caprosuchus horde that attacks the uh, Triceratops herd later in the book. Originally, that was supposed to be a group of Tarbosaurus. 
uh, but it was going to be all juvenile Tarbosaurus. So like 20 foot long, 10 foot tall ones, uh, six foot long, three feet, three foot tall ones. I like the uh, idea that was of, you know, mass feeding frenzies of small young tyrannosaurs that didn't have a proper home. And they could even have been looked at as the father and mother T-Rex's offspring that had grown up. But I didn't want to have more than one Tyrannosaur in the storyline. And <clears> the <throat> same thing went with the uh, Utah Raptors and Deinonychus. Uh, I was kind of wary to have two different types of Dromaeosaur in the storyline. But because they occupy different niches in the environment, the Deinonychus hunting the sp- Smaller animals up in the treetops and the Utah raptors hunting larger prey and humans in the valley at night. Um, the Quetzalcoatlus was originally a uh, Suchomimus that was living in the floodplain. But I thought having a Suchomimus and a T-Rex and Utah raptors uh, would be a little bit congested. It wouldn't really feel believable. I mean, it's noted in the book that the natural environment's been changed completely. Like, there's no more elephants in the landscape. There's no more tigers or crocodiles. They've all been outcompeted. But I feel like I had to create a somewhat realistic biome where these animals could flourish without rubbing shoulders too greatly. So you have the T-Rex. You just have two T-Rexes and their infants living further north in the valley. Then you have the Quetzalcoatlus hunting the floodplains, and then you have Deinonychus and Utah Raptor just going across the valley, going through the jungle itself, and then you have the Caprosuchus primarily hunting on the waterways. Um, as far as Tyrannosaurus Rex, why I chose that theropod uh, is because it's my first book, and I didn't want to confuse people too much because... It's one thing if you say Carcharodontosaurus or Acrocanthosaurus to a, another paleo fan, but if you just know dinosaurs from Jurassic Park and you pick up a book and you read Carcharodontosaurus, what the hell is that? And then you read the description and you're like, oh, oh it's just a bigger T-Rex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't, I'm going to use Carcharodontosaurus in the sequel, but like I thought for the first book, probably best to play it safe. Um just having feathered dinosaurs as it was is enough of a deviation from traditional paleo fiction that it could shock a lot of readers. Actually, that uh, is some. Sorry, X2. No, go on. Oh, I was going to ask you, actually, speaking of uh, your choice of Carcharodontosaurus for book two, uh, that was something I was kind of interested in, because like you said, uh, paleo fans, like we could list off a dozen differences between Carcharodontosaurus and Tyrannosaurus, but I suppose for the regular viewer, or reader, should I say, um, what what do you think uh, Carcharodontosaurus can bring to the table in your books that uh, T-Rex possibly couldn't have? Um, in all honesty, I think the one thing that it can't bring to the table that T-Rex could would be just familiarity and also the way that it, it could, could attack because we know Carcharodontosaurus uh, primarily used its jaws and teeth for slashing rather than uh, breaking bone, right? Uh-huh. Um, That's quite correct. And they also have the slightly longer forelimbs. So in the chapters that the uh, Carcharodontosaurus appears in, uh, you see uh, this specific one nicknamed the Goliath. You see how he serves as an apex predator in the environment and how he uses his body to hunt and kill. So we see what kind of damage he can do to a couple American jeeps, and we also see what happens when he gets into a fight with a large uh, ceratopsid and how he fares trying to take down larger prey animals like Giraffe Titan. So you've just just revealed another dino for your uh, next book, Giraffe Titan. That's that's an exclusive, right? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it is. (laughs) Well, actually, that was... uh, Mike actually answered part of my... Mike had the same question I did for the first half. I'll go into my second half of what you just mentioned. Since you just name dropped Giraffe Titan, 
What other new species of dinosaur and prehistoric fauna can we expect to see in the sequels and future titles in the Primitive War series down the road, outside of the ones you've already revealed? Okay, so uh, with the sequel that I'm editing right now, the current lineup is Utah Raptor, obviously, uh, Carcharodontosaurus, and Kylosaurus, uh, Pachycephalosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, uh, Sonoranathoesis, I may be pronouncing it incorrectly. Uh, it's a very, very small uh, species of dromaeosaur, but they have a feature in the book that will definitely get people on a psychological level. <laughs> um, and also... Uh, Sukumimus finally gets to come back and make an appearance. Uh, and then you have Giraffe Titan, of course. But uh, Carnotaurus as well. Those are the main dinosaurs for the sequel right now. Um, you see a lot of Ankylosaurus and Giraffe Titan and Pachyrhinosaurus and other species of herbivorous dinosaurs. You see them. Uh, living in herds on this savanna in Angola, and you see them interacting around water holes and how they coexist together. But you also have these intense sequences with the carnivorous dinosaurs like Carcharodontosaurus and uh, Suchomimus and Carnotaurus. The Carnotaurus, I was really wary of including in the story because I always wanted to write about Carnotaurus, but I didn't want to get too many comparisons to Jurassic Park because, you know, I had the traditional lineup of Raptor, T Rex, Large Flying Killer. Uh, so with the sequel, I was kind of wary of including Carnotaurus because that's the similar lineup to. The Lost World, but I think the Carnotaurus that appear in my book are going to be vastly different than Michael Crichton's vision, namely because they act more like a pride of lions than they do a, you know, camouflage predator. In the uh, third novel, Allosaurus is going to make an appearance, and we're also going to have uh, Utah Raptor again, but with the uh, third novel, the plotline actually takes place in multiple countries. Uh, the journey of the characters in the third novel isn't just in one country. They go from country to country across the planet and see all these dinosaurs in all these different environments and countries and situations. Not to give too much <clears throat> away. Um, Ethan, do you, do you explain in the book? I can't really remember. I'm sorry why the dinosaurs are here in modern times? What's, what, what's in your mind going on there? Uh, as far as what's going on in the... Uh, how that plays into the future novels? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that is one thing that is a huge element of the storyline. In the first book, the dinosaurs are brought to Vietnam because of a particle accelerator, kind of like a large hadron collider or the Cosmotron. Uh something that they just called the Collider, uh, misfires and creates a wormhole that dinosaurs come out of. But the actual technology itself and what the uh, different governments in the world are trying to do with that technology uh, plays a major role in the uh, storyline for the entire series. I don't want to spoil too much because <laughs> it kind of like comes full circle. And... Only time will show what I mean by that, but the Collider may not have seemed like that big of a deal in the first book, and it probably won't seem like that big of a deal in the second book. It's going to be looked at primarily as just a piece of technology, but let me just say that the introduction of the technology in the first book is going to come back to bite humanity in the ass hard by the third book. That was absolutely. The way the first book ended with the breakout, that just tells me that this problem is going to spread beyond Vietnam and potentially become a global dinosaur apocalypse 
type, sort of deal, like the Dinosaur's Attack series from Tops back in the 80s. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> nothing, nothing that barbaric. God, Dinosaur's Attack, I couldn't touch on anything that graphic and horrific. <laughs> I don't have the stones. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see how they're talking about? Uh, somebody wrote an article about how there has to be a dinosaur attack movie made. Like this guy who wrote for Fangoria or Bloody Disgusting or something. He wrote like a huge article saying that Dinosaurs Attack has to be the next movie about dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it can be a dinosaur movie, but it's, I think Predator War should be the next big dino film. Yeah, sure. Why just one? I think there's enough for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, wasn't there a funny thing about uh, when um, they made it with uh, Dinosaur Attacks, they made it as far as uh, pre-production, but then uh, I suppose Jurassic Park came out and they kind of didn't want to be seen as a direct competitor, so they uh, changed it to Mars Attacks. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so uh, they came close in the early 90s, but yeah, they got cold feet, they figured they didn't want to go head to head with that because that happens a lot with Hollywood at the during the 90s where you'd get two similarly themed um, films like you'd have Armageddon going up against uh, Deep Impact, you'd have A Bug's Life going up against Ants and somebody would always come out the worst so they didn't want to be uh, seen as trying to compete with Spielberg and Universal's Jurassic Park so they changed it into an alien movie rather than a dinosaur movie. Well, dang, now I'm kind of conflicted, because I don't know... I really like Mars Attacks, but Dinosaurs Attack with 90s special effects? It's kind of a hard choice could right there. Could have been a lot of fun. Ah, well, you know, we're in, living in an age of reboots, so, I mean, yeah, sure. I'd say they, there's plenty of potential there. A more lighthearted and wacky kind of uh, dinosaur madcap adventure. I suppose if we see... Oh. Uh, the trailer for Rampage, which is like a kind of a kaiju uh, fun kind of movie based off a video game franchise. It's starring Dwayne Rock Johnson. So the trailer for that's dropped now. So seems to be a lot of buzz about that. If that does well, that could well leave uh, the door open for a zany dinosaur movie in the form of Dinosaur Attacks. So fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. It really is a good day to be a fan of Daikaiju and a fan of dinosaurs. It really is. <laughs> Yeah, uh, lucky times. <laughs> and speaking of adaptations, it, do you have plans for, Mark Robert asked, is, do you have any plans for a film adaptation of Primitive War? And my personal addition is, is are there going to be plans to adapt the series for either television or maybe even adapt into something like comic books or graphic novels? So I was previously working on adapting a screenplay uh, into a short film that would be split up and released episodically as kind of a mini-series. But that fell through because, you know, I'm 23 years old. Uh, it's easy for me to spend my life writing and pursuing my writing projects, but for film students and CGI modelers and animators, it's a lot harder for them to, like, 100% put themselves to a task like that especially when they have to worry about their own education, their own jobs, day-to-day -day lives, all that. So uh, I already have the finished screenplay, and it would have actually been kind of a prequel to Primitive War because it would have shown how Andre Wynn ended up in the uh, research station at the start of Primitive War. It would have shown his journey getting to that place and what led to his addiction. Uh, it would have been split up in the narrative where uh, it would have been half, half of it would have been him uh, being interrogated by a CIA agent after the events of the first book. And then the other half would have been flashbacks to his time in Vietnam living amongst the dinosaurs trying to survive and also getting to the point where he became a severe morphine addict. 
So <laughs> no plans right now for anything, but you know, uh, if anybody knows any uh, agents or anything, uh, <laughs> hit me up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the frustrating thing about being a self-published author is that uh, even if you know that what you made is good and worthwhile, uh, it's not going to uh, magically fall into the right person's hands. You have to actually get it to that person's hands. So that's where all the marketing and uh, query letter writing goes into play. So who knows? Maybe someday. I personally think Primitive War would be better as a mini series than a full-on film okay. but that's if you wanted to get like really <laughs> in-depth the characters if if the characters were kind of put on the back burner i think it would work well as a movie but you know if you want to play true to the arcs and the storyline gotta go with that full-length mini series so who knows maybe netflix <laughs> yeah well netflix, you're living but, in yeah. a golden age of uh uh, high quality and high budget TV shows. So uh, you know, Westworld, Stranger Things, you name it, like they're kind of proven concept there. And there's a great appetite for all things sci-fi at the moment. So uh, fingers crossed. Uh, Definitely cool. fingers crossed. Is that right? Yeah, I, I just need to start taking copies of the book and throwing them at directors' faces and just yell, "Make it, make it into a movie." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess that's how you would have to go about it as a self-published person. And personally, I think the TV route would probably be the best way to go about a live-action setting. Or even adapting into a comic series, that would actually be a lot of way to create exposure for Primitive War. Yeah, I was actually uh, talking to a few different comic book artists. Uh, Organizing that level of a project where, you know, uh, if I were to have Primitive War be adapted to a graphic novel or a serialized comic book, I would probably want to write the adaptation, like the actual script for each issue. So that would be a lot of like screenplay writing where you describe what's happening in each panel and what captions need to go where, where voice bubbles need to go, and then trading that off with a comic book artist that's going to commit to adapting a 400-plus page book that's the hard part. Finding somebody with that level of commitment that's willing to go along with that project. Um, that's something that I want to do, though, is I, I really want to adapt the novel to a graphic novel format because, personally, I love Batman. <laughs> I love Batman's uh, graphic novels, and seeing Primitive War realized in that kind of fashion would be incredible. Uh, also... I could make an audiobook or a serialized audio play, that'd be great as well. It's just a matter of finding the right people with the uh, right amount of talent and know-how and commitment. The fact Being a writer, that- though, is easy because I'm my own boss with writing. I just have to make sure that I actually put the work into it. Um, I don't have to rely on other people to do the work for me. Uh, I've done pretty much all the editing myself, all the formatting and revising uh it's not like making a film where you have to work with 20 people simultaneously it's just all on you so i did have rap vietnam is a pretty popular subject right now too with with, uh ken burns pbs special that was pretty great so maybe that could help you uh have it see light as well Maybe. I also think that uh, Primitive War in general is very antagonistic to uh, most people's taste as far as what you would see on television because most people don't like to see their favorite characters die. As you know, previously mentioned by Greg about Game of Thrones. Walking Dead, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it has to be on HBO or something, I think. I don't think it could be on NBC. <laughs> yeah, you definitely couldn't have somebody shooting up morphine on NBC and then somebody else getting torn in half by Utah Raptor. Right. Or maybe FX. They're getting to be like at HBO. <laughs> hey, if I could meet the guys from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, my dreams would come true. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. I say Netflix or HBO are the best bets for a Primitive War show to be sustainable. Yeah. 
Probably Netflix yeah. would be the best shot since you would have the free reigns creatively to have it be R rated. You just gotta, you know, have the right people involved on the on the production side. I would have to say Jake Gyllenhaal would have to play Ryan, <laughs> and uh, Matthew McConaughey would have to play Eli. Oh, that's that's, in that's interesting because whenever I see a movie of a book I read. It's always kind of weird to see who they envision as as the actors playing mm -hmm. the people, you know. Yeah, that goes. Well, I mean, that, that goes into a question that I actually just thought of. Who would you? Who are you? Aside from the two you just mentioned, who would you cast for the human characters in a primitive war movie? Aside from the two you just mentioned. Oh man, that's kind of hard, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. See. I've thought about this for years, but the only two I've come up with were the ones I just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> he stumped you. Yeah. What, love, what about a love interest? Just kidding. Love interest? Uh, just well, kidding. we all know what happens to her. <laughs> Mila Kunis. <laughs> Mila Kunis is Susan. <laughs> just, just whoever it is, just don't get too attached, okay? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Take that, Valentine's Day. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, good point. R.I.P. <laughs> now, this, goes into, this goes, into my, this goes into my question about the human characters. Did you base any of these characters in the book off of real people? If not, then how'd you come up with the various backstories and personal demons that the members of the Vulture Squad and the Russian Spetsnaz, you know, the Dogs War, have to deal with? <laughs> so, well, the question. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um... So some of the characters, their names are directly lifted from people in my life. So Xavier Wise is a combination of Xavier Rudd, one of my favorite musicians from Australia. Uh, and Wise is the last name of one of my best friends. Uh, if you remember in the book, Andre Wynn, he says, uh, but I've been wrong before. That's uh, something my friend Jason would always say. So Xavier Wise was kind of like a combination of those two characters, or my friend and that musician. The idea of somebody that has that warrior heart and instinct, but simultaneously uh, has that more natural, primitive calm to him, that kind of peace and understanding in nature. Um, Logan having schizophrenia was directly inspired by a uh, close friend of mine that had schizophrenia and I wanted to <clears throat> explore what that mental illness was because um, I don't think I ever really see it get much attention or focus unless it's as a scary thing like schizophrenia oh no he sees things he hears things it's scary but in all reality, like, it's a mental illness. I mean, it's afflicting a person. It's hurting a human. So, Logan, I really wanted to uh, portray him in a positive light. And with his storyline, like, it kind of leaves it up for debate um, whether his mental illness... Uh, weighs down or outweighs his humanity as a person or what humanity he has left by the end of the book, but I think the answer is obvious. Um, most of the characters, uh, they weren't directly inspired by people, but uh, more inspired by the things that I saw in other people and the things that I saw in myself especially with the uh, alcoholism and morphine addiction. Not that I'm a morphine addict, but I live in Kentucky, and most of the eastern United States uh, struggles really badly with the heroin epidemic. And a lot of people look at heroin addicts and they say, how could you do that? How, how could you ever think to do an opiate? Like, why would you take those pain pills? But in all reality, the answer is right there. It's just a matter of if you're willing to look. Um... I wanted to bring humanity to these <clears throat> characters, the things that they've gone through, because with the things that I've gone through and the things that I've seen in my life, um, 
it humanizes and it humbles uh, the people going through it. You know, somebody that's badly addicted to an opiate, such as somebody that you would find on the street, or Andre Wynn, or even Ryan Baker, like those two characters, they're no different than the people you would find overdosing in a back alley. Uh, some people may say that they shouldn't be alive, but in these two characters, you see that they aren't just their addictions. They're not just their faults and their flaws and their illnesses and their suffering. They're more than that. They're still human. It's just a matter of their own personal, mental, and spiritual diseases destroying that humanity. But, you know, that's the main theme of the book is that survival of the human spirit is always attainable. This segues into my question regarding the themes of the Primitive War series. The, the <coughs> question is, regarding the theme of Primitive War, escapism is something that you frequently showcase throughout the novel, be it in dialogue or in actions. How did you go about setting the story's main theme on this in particular? And for the other two books, the themes of death and survival and evolution, how did you go about selecting those to be the main themes of the sequel books? So, in the first book... Um... When I first started writing it, there wasn't any kind of theme whatsoever. There wasn't any kind of greater storyline to write. I was just writing a book about soldiers encountering dinosaurs, but with each subsequent draft, um, it became... I would dig more and more into the psyche of the characters and the greater implications of their lives in the storyline. And... Most of the characters in the first novel, they've already gone through hell and back as it is. Um, they've already... Do you hear that? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Uh, sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. Anyone who's hearing this while we're recording? <laughs> Cuckoo clock? <laughs> It's or a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed seemed very appropriate as I was talking about mental illness to hear the dong dong dong. Yeah, I'm I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty. That's Mike's clock. I was afraid. Uh, I was afraid my dachshunds would start barking. You say you have a dachshund too, but luckily they yeah. Didn't so far, I've got a house full of crazy cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So. Uh, Anyways, um, as I got further and further into uh, each subsequent draft of the first novel and I started to dig more deeply into the psyche of the characters and what their lives are in the books, um, you know, escapism just naturally arose as the theme for the first book because all of these characters have already dealt with horrific trauma that has determined who they are in the setting of the book. And I wanted to explore that escapism that they were all seeking, whether it be through drugs, suicide, or simply just going home and living a normal life. And I also wanted to explore how being in that environment can change you, which we see through Leon and Sergei, who serve as a foil to one another. Uh, they're both, you know, the rookies of their team. But as they grow throughout the storyline, you see their different paths of survival. Some people choose to survive through, you know, escape, look forward to the future, grow and learn. Other people only dig themselves deeper into the holes they're already in, like Sergey hiding out in that pit and just waiting to break out Nikita. He doesn't see any other way to survive other than marching towards the same destination. Uh, with the sequel that I'm editing right now, the primary theme is uh, fear and how fear can lead to the creation of evil, but also fear can lead to the creation of heroes. So, in the first book, most of the characters are dealing with 
the theme of escapism because they're either trying to escape from dinosaurs, escape from POW camps, or they're trying to escape their own personal experiences. In the second novel, we see how fear can lead to the creation of men like that. So, in the, I'm trying not to spoil too much, but in the sequel, we'll actually see like how characters get to that point. When you see the characters, they're going to be fresh faces. They're going to be bright and jubilant and ready for their adventure with dinosaurs and crazy adventure, but you rapidly see how the fear turns young men into grave, grave old men very quickly. But also it can lead to, you know, redemption, moving through your fear to become a better human being to others. In the third book... Hmm? Um, Ethan, is the second book... Gonna, are the men going to be on a pibber boat going up the Delta, like in the Heart of Darkness? As a sailor in Africa? Kind of. Uh, what it's going to be is they're going to be going through the savannah into the jungle and then going uh, downriver. But they're only going to be on the water for a couple chapters. Uh -huh. uh, I was going to uh, name the book uh, Primitive War, The River Nihil, but that was more of a pun of the Nile River. So if you didn't know how to pronounce Nihil, you could look at it and say, oh, the River Nile. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But... But probably not going to go with that. I'm currently toying with the idea of naming the third book Primitive War, Infernal, uh, or Primitive War, Infernal Night. Um, something that kind of inspired the name of Primitive War is uh, I wanted to get the, the same amount of, uh, what do you call it, like the beats in a word? Is that a consonant? Uh, or, uh, I know, you know you get but yeah, I can't think of the phrase. Um, hmm. Syllable or yeah, yeah, syllable. Syllable, yeah. yeah. Syllable, there yeah. We syllable, I think it is. Okay. Alright, so uh, think about it. Jurassic Primitive War. Right? <laughs> four and four. Um so the Lost World, Infernal. I want to go with, like, same amount of beats for the subtitle, because I feel like there has to be a subtitle for the second book, just to, like, keep kind of, like, playing that uh, hidden homage to Michael Crichton. Right. But That's it is pretty really interesting a title. <laughs> Okay, Ethan, have you ever, ever heard of that squid that has um, hooks in its suction cups? Because that kind of reminds me of your uh, Quetzalcoatlus tongue, you know, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Um, the idea of being grabbed by something wet and slippery that somehow can also bury itself through your body and tear your flesh is... Almost unimaginable terror if you were to actually encounter that. Because if you were to get attacked by a bear or a crocodile or a snake, you know, it's pretty traditional and easy to make sense of. It's a feathery or a furry or a scaly animal taking a bite out of you. But having just some wet, slippery thing wrap around your leg and then <laughs> nails going through your flesh and digging into your bone as it drags you, that's just borderline Lovecraft like things that you would never imagine or experience in your day to day life. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people that have been attacked by that squid and they didn't enjoy it, but most people have never even thought about that possibility. Yeah. Just like just like not many people imagine having their stomachs cut open and their organs pulled out while they're alive. Yeah, there's something to it as well where I think what's kind of cool about that uh, 
creepy Quetzalcoatlus tongue is that it's almost like a creature unto itself and that it kind of crawls after you almost on its own power searching through the undergrowth for you and then you know when it does get a hold of you you know that's just the beginning of your problems because you're not just hack trying to hack away this horrible slittery thing you realize it's drawing you into this much bigger and even more horrible monstrosity so doubles up the uh, the horror of the uh, scene i think and also nobody ever got the chance to cut the tongue off before i pulled them in the rest of the way <laughs> because you know there are some characters in the book that have close encounters with dinosaurs and they survive like when they get attacked by the dinonychus most of them manage to get away beaten up and bloodied and cut but you know not mutilated um but most of the characters that get into a sticky situation don't come out of it alive mm -hmm. they end so up sticky <laughs> yeah they end up passing through a digestive tract that's right <laughs> well that's one rather graphic way of putting it <laughs> yeah speaking of animals were there any animals that you wanted to feature in Pillar of War but you couldn't for time constraints or for some other reason Mm. Nah, not particularly. Um, I will say that there was a chapter of Quetzalcoatlus where they make their first appearance uh, that I didn't include in the book. Uh, it would have been before the Russians encountered them, and it wouldn't have ended in any fatalities. Uh, but I didn't include it because I was trying to, like, keep the uh, length of pages down. But essentially the chapter would have been Ricardo and uh, Nguyen uh, flying on the Father Vulture helicopter through the valley. And as they're flying through this big valley on a bright and clear sunny day, uh, they get attacked jaws style by something outside of the helicopter and they don't really get, get a good look at it they'll just see like a wing go across the window and then suddenly there's a hole punched through the wall of the helicopter and then they'll feel the talons of the Quetzalcoatlus' legs grabbing the uh, undercarriage of the helicopter and pulling it down and then maybe a tongue going up over the cockpit and scratching at the window with the barbs. Uh, it would have been a fun chapter to include, but I had to make up for a uh, page lane. Uh, I actually plan on releasing um, an extended version of the first book, kind of like a collector's edition, where uh, all of the black and white artwork that I've been releasing for the animals by uh, Bruno Hernandez, um, I would include all of that artwork in this book, and I I would also include the chapters that I previously omitted and possibly a different cover, like maybe the same cover, but, you know, hand-painted or something. Uh, that's something I'd like to pursue this year, just like a special edition for fans of the book. You have my address, Ethan. Send me one of those, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, you guys will all get one. <laughs> yeah. I want to make it hardcover, but hardcover is a uh, hard. Uh, no pun intended, a hard process to uh, get into. Yeah. But when I'm done editing this draft of the second book, uh, that's my next step is extra things for the first book. Cool. Awesome. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually looking into making animated uh, commercials for the first book. <laughs> and uh, what me and this animator, producer, are talking about doing is taking sample chapters and doing readings of the sample chapters with corresponding, you know, animated artwork that Rap made uh, with music and sound effects. So kind of like a cartoony book reading thing. Uh, I'm not doing a good job describing it, but it would be very cool. That's something that I'm looking into doing in the next couple months, so hopefully... You know, maybe by the uh, beginning of spring or the end of spring, we'll see a, a really good book trailer for Primitive War. Ethan, one thing I would say is is be brave. I mean, Crichton 
he brought in Spinosaurus into the third uh, book movie. And look what a famous celebrity Spinosaurus is now, even though he might not have been that all well known to people previously. And then even, even in the original Jurassic Park, I mean, who knew what a Velociraptor was before Crichton brought out the book? You know, not that many people. So I, you're, you're going to put a Carcharodontosaurus in the next book, and that's awesome. But, uh, yeah, try to maybe bring at least one new one to each book, I hope you could do. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's not going to be a problem at all. Uh, like I said, for the uh, second book, we have... Oh, wait, do you mean, like, species that we haven't seen in media yes. before? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, well right. in, in, in your books, too, you know. Yeah. Or if yeah, I, definitely if, gotta... if I may interject, how about some animals that are relatively obscure to the general public, like, say, some super yeah. crocs, like Sarkos... Let's be brave. Sarkos... <laughs> yeah, be brave. You know, like, uh, <laughs> have some super crocs. They haven't been represented nearly enough in popular culture. Like Sarcosuchus yeah, or Dinosuchus. I haven't seen hardly anything in paleofiction showcasing those giant super crocs. Okay, so this is my own personal feeling about super crocs. Uh, I read a book called Amazonia by James Rollins. And it's a really good adventure book with a lot of weird monsters popping up in the jungle, but... One thing that I absolutely didn't enjoy was there is a scene where the uh, characters in the book get attacked by a couple of giant caimans. So they're black caimans, but the caimans are, you know, like 30 feet long. And as I was reading it, my reaction was, oh, so they're just bigger caimans. Ooh. <laughs> like, I like Dinosuchus and I like Sarcosuchus, but, like, I personally think that uh, most readers might have the same reaction I had when I read that book the first time, which was, oh, so it's a bigger crocodile. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd have to go for, like, there's Xenosaurus and um, just animals that had shapes that wildly go against what most people assume dinosaurs look like. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you have any more suggestions for species, definitely throw them at me. Cause mm. are, we restricted, th are we restricted to just the Mesozoic era, or could we bring in some Cenozoic era reptilian predators into the mix? Because I know something <laughs> that could be pretty cool to feature. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Gorgon Opsid for one. That's even earlier. Right. That's even That yeah. predates the dinosaurs. They'd be yeah, perfect. <laughs> But, hey, maybe uh, I could uh, maybe I could throw in a Chronosaurus if I feel like ruffling feathers. <laughs> oh, oh, oh man, uh, oh man, some marine reptiles. Have you? Do you have? Chronosaurus didn't have feathers. What are you talking about? Well, most, <laughs> mosasaurs are lizards. They're not archosaurs, so they wouldn't have that type of structure to begin with. I know. I'm just making puns. Don't mind me. <laughs> See, yeah. I always liked. I always liked. Uh, Plesiosaurs more. I like uh, Elasmosaurus. I like the long snaking neck coming up out of the water with the little head on the end filled with teeth. But unfortunately, my childhood was a lie, and those things were not that scary. Yeah, they're fish eaters. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Now the big Pliosaurs, like Chronosaurus, they were formidable predators. Yep. Or Mosasaurus, Liopleurodon, big mouth. Uh, honestly, I think the scariest uh, aquatic creature of all time was probably uh, uh, Dunkleostis. Uh, oh, you know, I know. The, the dunk. That's hard -headed. A, I would absolutely love to have that fish featured in a Paleo Fiction story, actively killing people. That hasn't been done yet, to my knowledge. No. I mean, they were just, huge. They were huge. And just the teeth alone are more terrifying than a shark, because, like, I don't know why, like, uh, mosasaurs, uh, sharks, just, you know, the general, like, row of teeth is scary, but, like, an animal that has jaws designed exactly like bolt cutters, that is horrifying, because, like, you know, you could, you could get bit by a shark, and, you know, you'll have a row of puncture marks on your body, but if you got bit by a Dunkleosaurus, just one bite, and you're in half. Yeah, you're gonna lose. Not, uh, not to mention, he's gonna chew his way through the boat. <laughs> yeah, 
can. Those things, oh, can, they can bite. They can bite quite hard, from what I've read. They have a bite force that's like comparable to that of alligators, at the very least. Hmm. Well, I guess I know what I'm going to include in the third book. <laughs> I was hoping to avoid including chapters on the water because I don't want to go. I don't want to be too derivative and stick too closely to the formula of the first book, which was, you know, walking on land and then being on a boat. Um, but, yeah, I could totally see in the third book when the uh, main characters are going down the Amazon having a school of Dunkleosius coming up and tearing apart a boat and them having no other option but just start swimming to shore. So the third book is in Vietnam at all? No, uh, the first book is in the Vietnam War. In no, the, third, the third book is not Vietnam at all? Uh, the prologue takes place in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, the, second, the second book is actually in Angola during the uh, Portuguese-Angolan colonial civil war of 1975. It takes place at the tail end of that war in southwestern Africa. But the third book, I don't want to spoil it too much. No, I know. Because, like, I can't describe what the third book's plot line is without spoiling the second book. No, I understand. <laughs> That's fine. But, That's fine. With, but, I, can, I, can wait to, I can wait for that. <laughs> but well, the I prologue... Can't. The prologue in the third book will take place in Vietnam. Uh -huh. And we'll see the characters in different countries around the world. And towards the end of the book, they end up around the Amazon. But... The prologue will take place in Vietnam. So you'll have that little callback to the first I was first trying to book. think if there's any way you could bring this into the Second World War. You know, I mean, the Japanese are all in the jungle, and uh, even over in Europe they had the uh, the forest there, you know, that, that uh, would be pretty cool, uh, too. I don't want to get... I don't want to reveal too much, but uh, I have the same idea. You're all, it's just, it's you're, just, you're, you're way ahead of me, Ethan. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, like I'm trying. I'm gonna try to say it as discreetly as possible, but like I have the same idea of like including like the front lines from World War II, like exploring what an all-out world war would be like. But yeah. I'm doing it in. After Vietnam and Angola, did I kind of like reveal what the third book was without spoiling it too much? <laughs> I'm totally confused, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exploring a major war like World War II. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in more recent times, like the 80s or 90s. Oh, okay. I'm sure a lot of people listening will probably be like, they'll get it right away, and I'm sure when you look back, you'll be like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> well, they're smarter than I am, so that's all right. <laughs> I just don't want to spoil things too much, because uh, I actually had this idea for the series, like how the second book and the third book were going to be. I had it planned out since I was writing the first draft of the first book. It's always been leading to the same end result in the third book. Uh, that's why when I first started marketing the first book, I was saying this is the first in a series because you know some of the end, some of the events in each book, uh, the ideas come up later, but like the overarching storyline, the uh, chain of events that was set off with the collider in the first book has been leading all the way from the first book through the second book to the end result in the third book. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just a World War II nut, so I, I was always thinking I'd love to see this in uh, the Second World War. You know, Japan would be pretty similar to the first book, the jungle-wise. But like in the, you could be like in the Arden Forest in Europe and uh, the sound of dead guys echoing through all those trees or something as they scream. Their yeah. Like, scream. Oh, know. yeah. That's, uh, that's one of my favorite places to explore for the third book. The one that I'm most excited for fleshing out is uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. And also Colorado. Oh, man, they're going to be everywhere. Oh, yeah, and it absolutely will. Um, cool. You know, 
you have that movie series called Jurassic World. And, you know, the problem's always been uh, getting the dinosaurs off the island. But in this series, the problem isn't getting the dinosaurs off the island to tell the story. The, uh, the story itself is about, you know, not dinosaurs coming off an island. It's about dinosaurs taking back what was theirs millions of years ago. That was the big selling point of uh, Lost World Jurassic Park was the fact that the dinosaurs got off the island. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but in the uh, short stories that I'm going to release before I publish the second novel, I have 150 pages of short stories. I don't know how many stories there are. I think it might be around like 10 or 15. But they're going to bridge the events of the first and second book. So you'll get to see what happens after the first book ends when you have all these dinosaurs spreading out from Vietnam, doing what animals do best, migrate and invade uh, new environments and biomes. So you guys want to hear some of the short stories that I'm going to be re releasing this year? Yeah, go right ahead. I'd be interested to see what people have come up with. So... I'm going to just like give you a list of bullet points of stories without getting too in-depth with what happens in each story. I'm just going to give you a list of bullet points, all right? A young girl in Laos befriends a uh, baby Dionicus. A fisherman in Indonesia encounters flying monstrosities while off at sea. Uh, poachers in China trying to get million dollar feather pelts encounter more than they bargained for in mm -hmm. the jungle at night. Um, the father Tyrannosaurus Rex is very unhappy with being confined to the valley. And gorillas not getting along with Utah Raptors. <laughs> so those, so that's not revealing too much, but those are some of the stories that I've written that kind of explore what happens after dinosaurs come back to the Earth and they start migrating out. It's just most of the events are not directly connected to one another, so... Before I publish the second novel, I plan on releasing the short story series as an anthology that people can download as an ebook or buy as a paperback copy. But they're it's they're anthologies for a reason because there's no like one thread going through each story. It's just kind of like snapshots of things that are happening in different countries where characters you've never seen before are trying to coexist and survive in a world that is suddenly uh, overflowing with these new uh, aberrations. The, uh, the one that I like the most is the uh, Indonesian fishermen at sea encountering the uh, Quetzalcoatlus. That's actually a three-parter where you get to see Xavier Wise and his team go in to investigate uh, after the fisherman goes through his experiences. The stories are also going to be a lot more lighthearted because the uh, novels are... You know, I don't really hold any punches with my novel writing. Because I have a vision for each novel, and I want to have as much impact as possible. But with these short stories, it's all just childish fun. For me, at least. I mean, you still have horrific violence and death and brutality. But it's still, like, what would it be like if dinosaurs started showing up on Earth? It's a fun idea. It's when you get into the actual war in the novels where all the horrific things arise. 
So, look forward to that. Well, that definitely call me hooked, to put it lightly, on this anthology. <laughs> Already. <laughs> Is that, uh, I think I remember you yeah, posting up somewhere that you were considering having, like, a kind of like a Primitive War contest to kind of have people submit their own stories uh, to the Primitive War, kind of maybe universe, perhaps even in a non-canon kind of way. I think that could be a kind of a cool way to drum up interest in the series. Are there any plans to go ahead with that? Uh, yeah, if anybody wants to send me a short story, uh, they're more than welcome to. Uh, we have the Primitive War discussion group on Facebook where I always... Uh, share art and talk about the books before I post anything on the Facebook page. So I want people to submit their own stories <clears throat> and their own takes on this fictional world. The only rules are they have to include certain species, like they have to kind of stay close to what appears in the first book. And they have to stay in the time period, and it has to be in a location that is accessible for a dinosaur to reach within a five-year time span. So, I'm just waiting for people to send their own stories and hopefully some fan art, too, because I wanted this book series to be as interactive as possible. That's why I included all of the art the book because I wanted people to be able to put themselves into this fictional universe as much as possible. Something that uh, always got to me when I was younger with Jurassic Park was that, uh, like I said, it's on an island. It's always about how do you get the dinosaurs off the island. But with this, it's about dinosaurs returning to the world and the world returning to the dinosaurs. So that gives people so many opportunities and so many routes to explore. Like I said, like it's not just flown dinosaurs; it's mass migration. So I want people to I want people to be able to submit their stories and submit their own artwork and their own interpretations of the animals. I want people to have that experience because you know growing up going onto the jurassic park legacy forums you know they would have the online text-based role-playing for jurassic park which was called live the legend which was fun being able to write about dinosaurs on the island but still it's just dinosaurs on an island it's not dinosaurs in southeast asia or dinosaurs migrating into russia or dinosaurs reaching the middle east So, I mean, it really is a full world. Um, I just want people to help me build it. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Well, I, I hate poachers, so I hope the, the feathered dinosaurs give them what's what. Oh, uh, they certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. Poachers are scum, pure and simple. Seeing them get torn apart, eaten by dinosaurs, is just so satisfying. Reminds me, that, reminds me of that recent story that happened in Africa where a poacher got, got, mauled, got mauled and eaten by a pride of lions that he was trying to hunt. Yeah. Great. You gotta love uh, poetic justice. That's right. Yep, indeed. <laughs> I, love that. I love any uh, plot synopsis that ends with get their comeuppance. That usually yeah. is a satisfying <laughs> That's ending. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, unfortunately, in the uh, Primitive War series, uh, by the third novel, uh, all of humanity will have its comeuppance. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. Am I spoiling too much? No, you're not really <laughs> spoiling much. I kind of figured. I kind of figured as much. You know, just like in a God, like in a Godzilla film. You know, sooner or later we're gonna get our comeuppance. Sooner or later, if we keep disrespecting nature and just disrespecting our planet. <laughs> I love man's hubris. The arrogance of man and thinking that nature is under his control and not the other way around. <laughs> Dinosaurs eat man. A uh, woman inherits the earth. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Where have I heard that from before? <laughs> <laughs> Why are they in Jurassic Park? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. 
I can no, see. I just need some quotables like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now to switch to my other a question I have here regarding things outside of the Pearl War. Do you have any particular favorite dinosaur films, video games, <clears throat> and books that you like watching or reading or playing outside of your own uh, book series? So, honestly, um, Jurassic Park, you know, I grew up on Jurassic Park. Um, I have Jurassic Park stuff all over my apartment. Uh, the Jurassic Park soundtrack is one of the only CDs in my car right now. <laughs> uh, but other than Jurassic Park, like the novels and the movies, uh, I don't really pay much attention to dinosaur media anymore. Um, I like the Turok game when it came out uh, back in 2008, the uh, remake that came out for Xbox and PlayStation. I enjoyed that a lot, but that was probably the most recent piece of paleo fiction that I've enjoyed other than Jurassic Park. Uh, I love watching dinosaur documentaries, especially the ones on BBC. Um, <clears throat> personally, uh, my favorite way to connect to dinosaurs in my day-to-day -day life is just through all of the uh, dinosaur paleo groups that I'm a member of. Getting to, you know, anytime I check Facebook, most of my news feed is just dinosaur art. And seeing all of these different interpretations, all these different reimaginings of the animals that I've known and loved my entire life is honestly more invigorating than seeing a new Jurassic Park trailer. <clears throat> but that's just me. Yeah, I, I can recommend two books. If it was interested in just the Vietnam War, I know it's a very depressing subject. <laughs> but uh, one's called uh, Dispatches. Uh, Dispatches is a really nitty gritty uh, tells you the whole story. But another one's called actually, Matterhorn. Matterhorn, you would like uh, Ethan because uh, one of the uh, soldiers gets uh, attacked and killed by a tiger in the jungle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe think of your book. So this is actually kind of a funny coincidence, but I've read Dispatches, and I actually love that book. Oh, it's, it's and I probably love, one of the best. Yeah, and it actually, uh, the name of the sh short story series that I'm going to release between Primitive War books is going to be called Primitive War Dispatches. Oh, or there you Dispatches go. from the Primitive War. Yeah, yeah a tribute. <laughs> Crazy. Read Matterhorn, too, uh, Ethan. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, I'll have to check it out. Um, I've read so many books on the Vietnam War. Uh, okay. Right now, right now I'm reading about Bosnia and the uh, Serb-Croat War yeah. back in the early '90s. So uh, not exactly light reading. <laughs> I can only I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, I but, once uh, had a dream of writing books all about kind of a a, a really good soldier who's in a time machine and he just goes to all the different wars and fights in the <laughs> It sounds like kind of where you're going with your books now. Yeah, it's all about just exploring uh, the darkest level of humanity, which is yeah. definitely uh, revealed during times of war. So, <laughs> we're going... I, I know that you see, like, the after effects of war on the human psyche in the first book, and you see a lot of like what war does to people. But in the second book, it's going to get much more into it. It's going to actually go into like the act of evil and the creation of evil. And the third book is going to go full on with, you know the amount of horror and tragedy that war can reap on human populations. It's going to, uh, the first book has a very somber tone. The third book is going to be like a funeral march into the fire. <laughs> yep, there's nothing glorious about war. <laughs> war is hell, as General, Tecumseh, right. as General Sherman put it. Yeah. Good callback. 
And that actually has that ties into a question I asked. I actually I had I was like, how did you decide on setting the story in the Vietnam War, and how did you go about researching the military, military weapons, tactics, and so forth for the story? And did you base any of this on your own, you know, short stint in the military? Um. So most of the um, actual research into the military and how they acted in that time was uh, through primarily like reading memoirs and reading non-fiction accounts of the Vietnam War. Um, I would say I was more involved with reading about uh, the atrocities of the Vietnam War and how they arose. So, uh, Tiger Force was a huge inspiration. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about what Tiger Force was because I don't want to get too dark and depressing in this conversation. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, reading about the weapons, uh, I did a lot of research into the uh, different rifles that were used back then. Um, most of the research that I did like that, that was done back when I was in high school and I was first coming up with the idea for the story. Um as far as the uh, way the soldiers acted, um, that was from just personal experience of being around soldiers. I used to, uh, when I first started writing the book, uh, I worked on a military base, so I had the uh, pleasure of being around soldiers that served in Vietnam, being around vets and former Green Beret Special Forces and being able to talk to them about their experiences. Um, but most of my research in the regard of the writing was primarily just for setting. Um, I know a lot of like military aficionados will get just as intense with the description of a rifle or the description of tactics as some paleo fans get intense with the description <laughs> of an animal or the behavior of an animal. Who me? I've actually re <laughs> yeah. I've actually received a lot of uh, negative reactions for having the characters in the book refer to the Utah Raptors by their name because in real life Utah Raptors weren't discovered until the 90s. But it's oh, like, yeah, good point. That's funny. Yeah. Yes. But it's like <laughs> It's like it's a book about dinosaurs in Vietnam. It's already completely detached from reality. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, can't make everybody happy. <laughs> uh, what one uh, scene in uh, one scene in the first Jurassic Park movie has always bothered me is the kid. He knows that those are uh, Gallimimus, and and there's so many ornithopods, and he's never seen one before. How does he know? <laughs> How does he know exactly which one? <laughs> yeah. Well, Why yeah, not or something else, you know? Well, Gallimimus were generally a bit bigger than your average uh, Struthiomimus or Orthomimus. So, like, an educated guess from Timmy's point on the spot, you know? Yeah, pretty hey, educated. Man. <laughs> I mean, hey, man, don't you I, dare talk bad about Ornithomimus, man. <laughs> hey, I'm not saying smaller. In fact, considering they're... they're, 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 they're Size they're, matters. Their, their gimmick was speed, so if you're smaller, you're probably better at running away from things. So, you know, smaller the better for an ornithomimid, I'd say. <laughs> Unless you're Dino Pyrus, and then you just kind of forgot there was a rule book and just did your own thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's funny that they would point out that Utah Raptor name, though. That's funny. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, and I actually had a friend of mine uh, point that out to me before I even published the book, and he was like, "You know, Utah Raptors weren't discovered until this point, right?" And I was like, "Yeah, but I'm not going to have the characters point at an animal the entire book and say, hey, look, it's that thing again.' <laughs> yeah. But yeah. lo and behold, I still hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Gonna call me out. For it. Gonna be honest. In my review for Geek Island, I'm pretty sure I did point that out, but at the same time, I did acknowledge, and say, "Okay, well." You gotta call them something, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I was more pointing it out as a uh, kind of a paleo curiosity rather than like a 
black mark against the book. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people take that seriously. Really? Uh, more so than others. Tell me about it. <laughs> I mean, right now, I'd say the primary audience for Primitive War are made up of intense paleo fans because those are the people that see all the artwork for the book uh, when I share it online. But I want the book to be as accessible to the you know, general population as possible. Most people that would pick up the book and read it, if they aren't intense dinosaur fans, they'll be able to get something out of the story and they won't be caught up on those minor details. Yeah. That's uh, the Catch-22 of writing. You can try to be as accurate as possible and have a little bit of fun, and you're always going to be upsetting somebody out there. Those who try to please everyone, please no one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If, if, uh, if that's the worst thing people can find in the book uh, in terms <laughs> of flaws, I think you're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like not, think so. It's not like they're going around saying the characters were badly written or the storyline was terrible, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, the kind of, that's the kind of criticism I've been dreading this entire time is like hearing something bad about the story itself or the way the story is told. So far, the worst things I've heard were uh, this dinosaur wasn't discovered yet or... Uh, uh, somebody got really upset when I shared some artwork of the uh, dozen or so Caprasuchus attacking the uh, Triceratops. I had people on Facebook saying, uh, there's no way two Caprasuchus could take down a Triceratops. But then I had other people jumping in to say, oh, it's not just two Caprasuchus, it's actually dozens attacking the Caprasuchus. Why don't you read the book first? <laughs> never, never thought I'd spark uh, internet arguments like that, but maybe it's a sign that I'm doing something right. That's right. Hey, if, I think it doesn't moment. matter what they're saying as long as they're saying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I see arguments. I see arguments all the time, even in things not pertaining to works of fiction, but even real life, for example, regarding dino matchups and so forth. Yeah, yeah it's it's a pretty dark, dark rabbit hole to go down sometimes. It's it's gotten to the point. A lot of the paleo groups I follow on Facebook and online in general, they have put in a rule into their charters saying, "Don't pice." Post who would win in a fight at uh, trends. <laughs> it just turns into a fight between humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got got fanboys on both sides. Oh, yeah. Well, my readers, of course, were very upset when uh, Spinosaurus defeated T Rex in the Jurassic Park. Boy, were they mad. I bet, I bet you had yeah. a lot of write ins on that. I sure did. You know, I, I was kind of bummed at the time, but uh, after a couple of days, I kind of got over it. The fact that we got people, we got people petitioning, like, here we are, what is it, uh, 12 years, 15 years later? You know, I know like, people still are not over it. <laughs> set, set, sending Colin Trevor petitions, you know, it's kind of like, okay, if that's the worst thing that's happened to you in the last decade and a half, I, I think you're living a pretty good life. That's, yeah, and right. I think it, it's kind of funny how much this shows our difference in age, but um, like I said, I'm 23. When I saw Jurassic Park 3 in theaters, I was a little kid. It was my first time actually seeing a Jurassic Park movie in theaters that I could remember. Um, and when I saw the Spinosaurus killed T-Rex, my first reaction was, no, T-Rex! And then my second reaction, five seconds later, was, whoa, that thing's so huge, and it's got the big nose and the long sail, and it's got the big arms. Holy shit, I can't believe it just did that. Whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> I, I was I was lucky enough to still be open-minded at that age. Yeah. But now when I watch Jurassic World and I see Indominus, Indominus Rex, I can't go and have that same reaction. My reaction's just, oh, man, that's... Uh, I'm old now. I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, wow. Talking about Jurassic Park, I was about, what, two or three, four years old when I first seen the very first film in theaters back in 1993. <laughs> Dang. Man, I was born in uh, 94. <laughs> so. You guys are babies. We won't talk about 
vacation. Uh, I, was, I was about I think nine years old when I saw the Lost World Jurassic Park in 1997. Yeah, I, I had one. I had one guy write me a letter saying, "Mike, you're old enough to have seen Jurassic Park when it first came out in the theater, right?" <laughs> you made me feel so old. Yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> you were old enough to have seen a lot more dinosaur movies than just Jurassic Park, Mike. I imagine. Like, <laughs> yeah, look, like, Right, like, right. like, say, Planet of Dinosaurs, any of the Ray Harry Allison movies, even. Yeah. That's like, how it's going to be in the future with dinosaur fans, is they're going to guess each other's age by what was the first Jurassic Park movie you saw in theaters. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Theater. Fallen... Yeah, I was too young to see Fallen Kingdom when it came out, but, you know, <laughs> I was able to see Jurassic World 6, <laughs> and I was... I think I'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I really hope that there's not a Jurassic World 6. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lost in space. I, I, guess, I, think I mean, I'll, I will always see a Jurassic Park movie when it comes to theaters. I will see every Jurassic World movie that comes out just because Hollywood has me by the finger. Like, <laughs> they, uh, I'm going to see every Jurassic Park movie that comes out, but, you know, I just hope that we get some more variety and some fresh takes on dinosaurs. Uh, hmm. Here's hoping. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, from what I've heard, I don't think there's, there's, there's... There should be at least one more film in this trilogy, but after that, I heard that the rights might be going back to the estate of Michael Crichton. Mm. Disney can afford it. They'll get it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Wow. Oh. Yeah, uh, maybe we'll get like a more faithful reboot, like something that's more directly drawn from the books. Maybe like Netflix will pick it up and turn it into a mini series. I would love to see a recreation of Jurassic Park and the Lost World, especially the Lost World, because the Lost World is so vastly different from the movie. I mean, I think my, uh, Steven Spielberg did kind of a perfect job with adapting Jurassic Park into a movie in terms of capturing, like, its own aesthetic and its own values as a story because Michael Crichton, when he wrote Jurassic Park, he included Tim and Lex to have the childhood perspective of dinosaurs. Um... And that definitely carried over into Spielberg's direction. But The Lost World was just like full-on action movie, whereas the book is much more involved with the science of the storytelling and exploring the science behind an island built for breeding dinosaurs. I would love to see that brought back. You know, dinosaurs don't have a really good track record on uh, television. You know, the uh, James Gurney's Dinotopia series d bombed really bad, unfortunately. And um, I can't think of the name of the Spielberg where they're in the future and they're in that fenced-in community there and the dinosaurs are outside. That that uh, fast, too. Yeah, I know you're talking about, and it really upsets me that I can't remember the name of it. I, was it Terra Nova? <laughs> Terra Nova. yeah. Newer. Yeah, um, this is my thing about paleo fiction and why I read so little of it is that most stories that involve dinosaurs are just about dinosaurs eating people and not much else. It's hard to find any kind of like thematic depth or emotional resonance in those stories because it's usually just dinosaurs are here, dinosaurs are doing crazy shit. <laughs> we have to re react to it. <laughs> right, are you beeping yeah. out those words? Huh? Uh, I don't have a way of doing that. Sorry, I, I, I'll just—I uh, think I'll I'm, let it stand. I'm sorry. I'm Since sorry. It's, it's a it's a Valentine's Day horror special. I'll let it stand for once. That's right. Yeah, horror, blood, cuts, hearts being ripped out. <laughs> um. Yep. <laughs> well, you know when you talk when you talk to a paleontologist, they they don't like the idea of dinosaurs being aliens and monsters. They want us to think of them as just animals. Yeah, um, and Primitive War, you see the dinosaurs do horrific things to people, but, you know, I wanted to still have them be animals because that's what Michael Crichton did. Michael Crichton had dinosaurs 
doing horrific things, but they're still accurate to what the times understood dinosaurs to be. And they still did things animal-like. The first time the T-Rex appears in the novel Jurassic Park, it's described as acting very bird-like, kind of darting its head around and nervously inching out to uh, take a goat in broad daylight. And in The Lost World, the first time you see the T-Rex, uh, he shows up just to mark his territory with uh, his anus rubbing up against the car. Um, <laughs> so even though the dinosaurs in my books may do scary, horrific things, they're still animals. They're still doing animal things. They're focused on what all animals people included are focused on eating, sleeping, mating, things that make a life worth living. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> and that's something I really give props for a primitive war. The animals are monsters to humans, but towards one another, they're just regular animals doing their normal things. That's how I interpret yeah. it, at least. Yeah, and you're going to get to see the animals in some of their uh, childlike wonder because I think there's only one moment in Primitive War where you actually get to see the animals through the perspective of beauty rather than oh man this thing's about to eat me <laughs> and that's when they're on the boat and they see the Triceratops hurt for the first time all the soldiers are terrified but you see Andre a scientist who's dedicated the past year of his life to studying the dinosaurs being able to see them and not feel threatened for him, it's a moment of beauty and clarity. And in the sequel, we're going to get a few moments like that because instead of it being Vulture Squad, there's a new team called Stalker Force that's been tasked with following the Utah Raptors and their migration and making sure that they don't spread out from the valley. So when you see those characters in the second book, they've had experiences with dinosaurs. So they're able to, you know, be around a herd of Pachyrhinosaurus and not be completely terrified. They're able to see the infants and say, oh, look at these cute little things. They're not any harm to us. They're no danger. I mean, we got to be cautious of that Carcharodontosaurus uh, further away in the forest, but these Pachyrhinosaurus aren't any threat to us. You get a few moments of that beauty and childlike wonder in moments like that, but then it's back to the adult uh, emotions of terror and running and screaming. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Sean's gonna have, have Sean's gonna have to be exiting here just a little bit. Yeah, I'm just heading off now, but uh, I kind of liked. Uh... That's a good time for me to go out. The fact that uh, Eaton just alluded to the bit, you know, how it always starts. Ooh, ah, but then there's... Uh, uh, <laughs> screaming. <laughs> screaming. <laughs> All right. Another yeah. quote from Jurassic World. Exactly. That's, I, yeah. I bid you. It's been very good talking to you, gentlemen. Uh, it was great talking to you, and uh, thanks uh, again for reading the book. No bothers. It's my pleasure. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye, Sean. Take care, Sean. Yep. Well, we'll see you next time. So, do you have uh, any more questions? I've actually gone through all the ones I had typed up on Facebook. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm good, but I, I, I was really, uh, forgive me, but surprised at how well you wrote this book. <laughs> For a young man, it was really well-written, good story. Good job. Thanks. Um, I know that the uh, first draft, there or the first edition there were some typos that I missed here and there but uh, you know I still pick up books that were published decades ago like I just finished reading Hell's Angels by Hunter S. Thompson one of my oh, favorite writers and there's still typos in that I mean oh, sure. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. just a never ending journey I mean you read a book 30 times or you know you edit and revise a book ten times and there's still always like one punctuation mark that was incorrect or maybe oh, like one no, word I, that was spelled wrong. I edit my magazine I give it to someone else to edit it comes back to me, I look at it again and still sometimes we miss some, some problems in there 
and being an editor, I can't help but do that. Every time I read a newspaper or anything, you know, I'm looking for all these <laughs> typos. Yeah, I mean, I love revising my work because I get to read it and experience it again uh, after having finished the previous draft, but always, like, keeping an eye out for things that can be changed or updated or corrected. Uh don't want to call it a never-ending journey, but you know it's not. Uh, it's not not fun. I mean, I love editing and revising and rewriting. I mean, yeah. that's the old saying: is that writing isn't writing; it's rewriting. Well, yeah. writing is also spending three years looking for typos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never-ending story. Uh, that, reminds yeah. me, that reminds me of a saying that one of my artist friends, Bob Eggleton, actually said recently about an artist's work never being complete, never being 100% finished, only something else. I don't know what that exact phrasing was, but it kind of yeah. like, reminds me a lot of writing in that regard. Yep. It's art. Yeah, the, the problem is the creator's curse where something never feels finished. Like, I still look at Primitive War and I think of different ways I could have written it. Like, when you create something, like a work of art, or music, or a book, you always see all the different angles you could have taken it from, like, all the different subplots you could have done differently, the different uh, ways you could have told the story. That's always going to be there, but you have to reach a point where you can look at it and say, I am totally content with other people reading this. Like, this is as perfect as I could want it right now, so... I mean, I could have easily spent another year editing and rewriting right. Primitive War if I wanted to, but I was at a point where I was happy enough with it that I could put it out for other people to read. Yeah. And I uh, actually reread it and did their typo hunt uh, earlier in January. And they always say, uh, write what you would run want to read. And Primitive War was everything I've always wanted to read. I just had to make it myself because nobody else was. Uh, I spent so much time looking up paleo fiction books before I wrote the book because I wanted to like see what other angles people made with dinosaurs. But like I said, with paleo fiction, uh, other than Jurassic Park, I haven't I haven't really found anything that ever captured my attention. Like, I've gone through so many paleo fiction books on Amazon, just, like, looking at what other people have published and trying to find something that captures my attention, but nothing has, honestly. There have been some paleo fiction books I've read that actually have caught my attention so much that I actually recommended them on past episodes of the podcast. Steve Allen's, Steve Allen's Meg series is a big example of a series that has kept me hooked since 1997, and it's getting a, a film adaptation here in August. So that's a series that I've absolutely enjoyed since that decade. Yeah, uh, one that I'm actually interested in reading is uh, Raptor Red, just because it was written by Jack Horner, correct? And it was written by Bob Barker. Yeah, Bob Barker. Oh, okay. And you know the interesting, uh, thing, the interesting, thing, the interesting thing about that book is that he has it in a specific place and in a specific time, and everything in the book was there. You know, were, were that period, that area of the world. You know, which was kind of a cool idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. The hard part for me with paleo fiction is just finding one that's more than just a story about. Dinosaurs. That's why I felt like I had to make my own because I couldn't find any like that. No, Jurassic Park. There's, had... there's good stuff out there. Yeah, definitely. Oh, there is. Definitely... I'll get to it in time. Yeah, you've got yeah. you've got plenty of time. One of the pub mm -hmm. one of the big publishers of paleo fiction and kaiju fiction lately is Severed Press. So that's one publisher to look for if you're looking for looking for paleo fiction to kill time or something. Yeah, um, right now most of the books I read are things that I want to be inspired by, um, because I think as a creator of any kind of format of art, 
you work as a sponge where you absorb the things that you enjoy and then you have translate them through your own mind into your own ability to create works of art. So somebody that might be a surrealist painter could be incredibly inspired by Picasso or Salvador Dali, but taking those two influences and making something new inspired by both can create something completely wildly different than anything anybody else has ever seen. Yeah. And speaking of uh, science paleontology, did, did you consult with any paleontologists while you were doing the research for the dinosaurs and paleofauna of Primitive War? I actually didn't, but I had a lot of friends that were uh, way more up to date on paleontology than I was because they may have been studying it in college or they may have spent more time just, you know, immersing themselves in knowing every bit of information about dinosaurs as it comes up. So I talked to a lot of friends and I would get their feedback on how they felt I was betraying a dinosaur or how they felt about this behavior or that behavior. But as far as actually, like, speaking to paleontologists, uh, never went that far into it. I'd like to, I just didn't have the proper connections at the time when I was writing. Maybe now that I do have more connections like that, I could potentially send the uh, second book out to other paleo you know, paleontology experts and see what they think. But I think what I'll get mostly from them will be you know, the same reactions I got from my first book, which was, oh, wow, I can't believe this happened with this character. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure if you said Tom holds a copy of the Primitive War books, he would enjoy them as a work of fiction just fine and dandy. He wouldn't be too hard on you for having things be, you know, anachronistic for lack of a better word. Uh, who'd you say? Uh, Dr. Thomas Holtz. Ah, uh, okay. He's, uh, I, actually, uh, I actually got to meet Jack Horner. Uh, I met Jack Horner at the uh, first ever Jurassic Park convention last year. Uh, Jack De Lamar uh, from Jurassic Outpost invited me out there to promote my book, and Jack Horner did a meet and greet at the convention, and I got to show him. I brought these pamphlets that had the uh, front and back cover of the book with the prologue, and in the back... There were two pieces of art that Raph made, Raph Lomaton, uh, namely the Utah Raptor, completely covered in feathers, standing in a creek at night, and the uh, picture based on Over the Edge, when Ryan and Leon are hiding in the brush and the T-Rex is directly overhead. I got to show him one of those, and I was talking to him about how, you know... Him working on Jurassic Park helped to inspire me as a child and led to me writing. But as I was talking to him and he reached the artwork in the back and he saw the Utah Raptor, he just kind of like stopped and held it up to his face and just kind of like poured over it, just like studying it very intensely for about 10 seconds. <laughs> um, and it was funny because he had actually said earlier during his Q&A session, somebody asked him, like, do you think we'll ever see feathered dinosaurs in Jurassic Park or in Hollywood in general? And he was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think people will ever think of them as that scary. And, you know, everybody's so familiar with scaly dinosaurs. But then as soon as he saw that art by Rap of the feathered Utah raptor, he just kind of momentarily dropped his jaw. <laughs> and there's actually a picture of him when he was leaving the uh, convention he was standing next to this, uh, one of those walking with dinosaur live show raptor suits. You know, the it's like a suit that somebody can wear where they look yeah. like a raptor, and hmm. it's like a 20-foot-long suit. Yeah, I, uh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, there's a picture of him when he was leaving the convention where he's standing side by side by that person in the raptor suit, and he's actually in the picture still holding on to that pamphlet of Primitive War, so... Who knows, maybe, uh, maybe when I publish the second book, I can get his feedback. You should. It'd be cool. He's Dad retired. Get you, yeah. you know, he's retired now. 
Yeah, he's probably too busy trying to make dinosaurs out of chickens. <laughs> uh, Jack Horner, Jack Horner isn't my wouldn't be my first choice, but I don't think he, he would hurt having him as a consultant. Doctor no. Holtz, if you need a tyrannosaur, if you need tyrannosaur experts, though, the two the top three minds I know of this are Doctor Phil Curry, Tom Carr, and of course the aforementioned Doctor Holtz. Those mm. are the tyrannosaur experts, hands down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And if you're looking for consultants for, like, say, armored dinosaurs, like ankylosaurs, one of the speakers I met at this year, at last year's uh, Dino Fest, is uh, Dr. Victoria Arbor from the Royal Ontario Museum. Mm -hmm. So if you need any feedback on ankylosaurs, she's your she's your lady to go to for that sort of information. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would absolutely awesome. love to speak to some experts. That's one of the uh, perks of the Cleveland Museum's DinoFest, is being able to see so many see, see different paleontologists and paleo artists come to Cleveland to have lectures and presentations and so forth. And I've gotten to meet quite a few over the past couple of years that I've been attending this event. Now, if only I could get similar connections to Zack Snyder or, uh, you know, <laughs> other directors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just a handful, just a litany of some of the people I have actually met at DinoFest. Pale artists I've met include Xenozoic Tales creator Mark Schultz, uh, Julius Chittany, paleo artist from Canada, and just this past year, Danielle Defoe from the Royal Ontario Museum. In person, anyway. Oh, wow. See, I get to work with all these paleo artists, but I've never been able to actually meet them face to face. The only artist that uh, has worked on Primitive War that I've actually met was the uh, cover artist because he actually lives in Kentucky. Um, I was at this art festival uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, he had this booth up with all these paintings that he did where he would take pages out of books and then he would paint on top of the book page something related to that. And... His artwork was just so great that I had to uh, get him to make the cover. So the cover hey, was uh, made digitally, though. Hey, Ethan, you ever go to uh, Wonderfest in uh, Louisville? Uh, no, I haven't, actually. It's uh, in June. You definitely ought to go. Um, like, like Greg just said, Mark Schultz is always there. Uh, really famous dinosaur artist. Um, William Stout's yeah. always there. And all kinds of movie people. It's it's mainly all about model kits, but um, fantasy model kits, you know, science fiction. You, you'd love mm. it. It's perfect for you. You got to go look up Wonderfest online, and uh, you'll see the dates. I'm pretty sure it's June. And uh, check it out. It's, it's really great. Yeah, big heard, big show. I've heard of Wonderfest, and I, isn't it also like connected to the Godzilla fandom to some extent as well, where they promote like X plus and other certain figures. A little bit, yeah. The the um, JD Lee's who does G Fest Mag Gene Fan Magazine was there when I was there last time. So yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to check that out. I definitely have to uh, do more on foot promoting for sure. Yeah, well, you're so close to it. You should definitely check that out. And if you're if yeah. you consider yourself if you're uh, consider yourself a Godzilla fan, you definitely got to make a point to come out to Chicago every July for the G-Fest convention. Yeah. G-Fest. I've been there a few times, too. <laughs> oh, man, that'd be fun. I just Especially went, if I, I just... get to see what... Okay. Especially if I can see what King Ghidorah looks like for the uh, next King, uh, the next Godzilla movie. If I can see that, then I'm definitely going to go. <laughs> I just went to my first G-Fest this past summer, and it was an amazing experience. Seeing all the seeing all the guests and seeing all the actors and people from Japan, the artist alley, that amazing dealers room, all of the panels on a whole diversity of topics, from pretty cool introspective retrospectives to analyses or even things for fun. I mean, there's something there for everybody if they're kaiju fans or even dinosaur fans. Because as mentioned, was there an open bar? <laughs> Uh, I think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe for you, Ethan, but no one else. <laughs> there is a... Yeah, the, op <laughs> the open bar will be in the flask in my pocket. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know G-Fest is a little off topic, but for, for this year, they have three guests confirmed so far. Act veteran actor Akira Takarada, 
Heisei era actor Mogumi Odaka and veteran suit maker Kaizo Murase. <laughs> suit Wow. Well, that's fun. Man, imagine being in one of those suits in Godzilla, just wearing a 10 foot tall rubber latex costume. I imagine that thing must have been unbearable to wear, how hot it must have been. Uh, oh, that would be oh, it was, trust me. I've listened to enough interviews with the late Haru Nakajima <laughs> and interviews on uh, panels he had with the other suit actor, Kapatro Satsuma, and uh, Sutuma Kitagawa about their experiences in the suits. And it was very interesting to say the least. <laughs> Especially that first suit for 1954. That thing was a that thing was a bulky beast, over 200 plus pounds. And that's something that that's something that I'd like to tackle is writing about kaiju because I am not familiar whatsoever with any kaiju literature, but uh, I imagine that if I wrote something about a giant monster, I could probably have a lot of fun with it. Oh, there's lots of great kaiju for kaiju books out there. I've read lots of great works. You know, if you really want to get something awesome, Kaiju started. Matt Danian's books, they are some of the best ones to start off with. The Atomic Rex novels, Chimera, Scourge of the Gods, Operation Rock, Kaiju Corps. Those are just a handful of the amazing titles that he has written. And for really, if you want to go to AAA territory, Jeremy Robinson can't be beat <laughs> with, the Project right. with the Project Nemesis series. Oh, I've heard of that, actually. Those are those are absolutely amazing works of kaiju fiction. That's just a small handful, and it's a very su well supported community. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a, a member of the uh, Godzilla group on Facebook. Love seeing all the uh, old production stills and all the old artwork of uh, Godzilla movies from days gone by. Yeah, and some of the people from the Godzilla uh, officially, officially, like this people that worked on the films, they're actually in that group as well. Oh, uh, you know, I just thought of something unrelated but really terrible. <laughs> you know, he said that the uh, Jurassic Park, the rights are going to go back to the Crichton estate. Okay. Well, you know who's been buying up every property in sight? Uh, Disney. <laughs> I do not want a Disney Jurassic Park. I do that's not a, want a Disney Jurassic that's Park. That's what I said. <laughs> that's what it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, start raising funds. Yeah. Oh, they've got the funds. <laughs> so, yeah, regarding movies and regarding Primitive War, who would be your choice to direct? Um, you know, honestly, um, it's not so much who I would have it direct, but who I would have produce it. Um, or more specifically, uh, what production company. I would love to see Primitive War brought to life by A24 Studios, the people that made Ex Machina and every great horror movie that's come out in the past decade, like The Witch. Um, I would love to see how they tackle it because I don't know who they're, who works in their photography department, like who actually like works on the uh, color palette and the design that they use in their filmmaking, but A24 Studios is... Absolutely incredible. I love what they make. Zack Snyder would be cool, too, though. I think Zack Snyder would relate to uh, the story told in Primitive War because Zack Snyder is kind of what you would call a man's man, where he makes things primarily about men for men. Um, not to be totally sexist in saying that, but if you look at a film like Batman vs. To Superman or 300 um, or even the Watchmen that's always been his angle is kind of like an postmodern Ernest Hemingway kind of style and I think he would easily be able to work with the uh, visual palette of Primitive War and also the action sequences and the uh, brotherhood and camaraderie that's prevalent throughout the novel, I think he would be able to understand that better than most directors seem to be able to. And so if Zack Snyder is available, you should hit me up. <laughs> and Find me. I, Zach, have, Zach actually having also experienced some personal losses in his family over the past couple of years could probably 
relate to some of the situations in the Primitive War book, so I think that might actually make him a possible good candidate to direct an adaptation of this uh, story. Yeah, if only I could get all of them. <laughs> Maybe uh, I, I hope that happens. That would be awesome to see as a film. Yeah. Uh, some of the artists that I've worked with on the book have been able to work with actual movie studios on other projects. So hopefully some of that can uh, reciprocate. Hopefully yeah. some of that can come my way. Yeah, watch what uh, yeah. Really, like, all it is is just, I don't want to say it's the right person seeing the art in the book, but, like, I can't sit and wait for the right person to find it. I have to go looking for them, but in all reality, it's just a matter of getting the book to the right person or getting the book to the right audience. Uh, something that I'm really grateful for is the fact that I've been able to interact so much with people that have enjoyed the book with the uh, Facebook page and the Facebook group because, like, I spent three years working on the book, and so for those three years, the only people I could talk to about it were my friends and family. And, you know, you can only listen to your friend talk about a book about dinosaurs for so many hours until you get <laughs> tired of it. So... My family's sick of it. <laughs> well, in your case, well, that's, that's why a lot of actors go on the stage instead of just be in front of a camera, you know, so they can actually hear that applause out there and, and laughs and stuff, you know. <laughs> uh, I had a friend. I have a friend who uh, served in the Special Forces. His name's uh, Andy. Uh, his name actually inspired Andre Wynn's name, Andy Andre Wynn. Uh, they also have a uh, same last name but spelled differently. Um, he uh, served in the Special Forces, and when he was serving in the Special Forces, I sent him uh, the second draft of Primitive War back when it was like 600 plus pages. And he gave me the best feedback I've ever gotten in my life, which is he told me that he shared it with his entire platoon and they like circled their favorite quotes in the story and they underlined their favorite uh, sentences and stuff like it actually resonated with them. And that's all I've ever wanted was to make something that would resonate with people. I want, I want people to be able to pick up the book and you know, empathize. I want them to feel it. I want them to relate to it. I want it to have a meaning to their life and where they are at that point in their life when they read it. Because I had a friend uh, hit me up the other day and he was like, hey, uh, is your book okay for 13-year-olds? <laughs> and I, I told him, like, um, yeah, he might grow up really quick. But because, <laughs> uh, yeah. like, I know if I was 13 years old, I would totally read Primitive War, and I'd be okay with it. But I know some people that are older than me that have read it, and they've hit points in the book where it makes them actually like reflective of themselves and their own life, where it makes them look at what all these themes and experiences in the book are and how it applies to who they are as an individual because when you're dealing with death and when you're looking at death from a subjective point of view rather than totally objective, it's hard not to identify with it. So, I mean, when you're reading a book where a character's best friend gets brutally killed, I mean, that might make you think about how how you would take a similar situation and how you would feel and what you would experience. So sure. I don't want to call it a, I don't want to call it like coming of age or something where if you're going to read it, you're going to suddenly become a man. But, you know, it's definitely something to, you know, kind of wake you up, uh, bring you into what reality could be. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, Ethan, I, I think I'm going to have to hit the road. Um, keep in touch, please. If, if my magazine could do anything to help promote the books, 
we're happy to. And um, we do sell advertising too. <laughs> and Greg, right. thanks so much I'm for the invitation. <laughs> oh, you're most welcome, Mike. It's been an honor to have the ed have the editor of the longest running prehistoric mag here to interview one of the best works of paleo fiction I've read in recent years. <laughs> it's it's oh, fun. Thanks. Um, and Mike, uh, I got your address, so I'm going to get you a early copy of the sequel once I finish editing this draft. I only have uh, about five or six chapters left to edit, and then I'll be able to print it off. And I plan on sending you and Sean and Greg each uh, early manuscript draft. Uh, it's definitely not going to be anything you're expecting based on what primitive war was this is going to be i don't know um gonna be kind of a revelation uh, because it's gonna it plays closely to the elements of storytelling that i used in primitive war but it's just going to be wildly different the experience itself can't wait I can't wait. Yeah. That's gonna be. That's actually quite an honor to be, to be sent an early sent an early draft of a sequel. That's a first for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got to get all the feedback I can get. And I'd be I'd be honored oh. I'd be honored to help provide that. I'd be honored. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, best of luck with everything. Thanks. It was nice talking to you, Mike. And uh, thanks again for reading. Talk to you guys later. Yep. I'll I'll see okay. you. I'll see you next time, Mike. Sounds good. Bye bye. Take care. Okay, I th so, you ready? Think I should uh, wrap things up? Sure. Um, yeah, if uh, anybody out there wants to read Primitive War, it's on Amazon, and there's also the Facebook page, which is you know Facebook.com/slash Primitive War Novel, and there I usually share artwork and interviews and you know, different things related to the novel. And there's also the Primitive War Discussion Group, which is just called Primitive War Discussion on Facebook. And that's where I actually, like, get really down into the details of my writing process and what's going on in the sequels and what I'm working on with other artists. It's just a better way to, like, interact with me and interact or understand what's happening with the series as a whole. And I always share artwork there before I share it on the Facebook page. So people are always welcome to join that. Um, I'm already a member of, I've already liked the Facebook page. I'm part of the group. And I also heavily promote Primitive War in my various groups that I administrate in. The primary one being the homepage for the podcast, Brute History, A Traveler's Guide in Facebook. And I also post all the new episodes on my YouTube channel titled Xterm Central. Don't worry, I'll try to get that changed to something a little more presentable. <laughs> <laughs> and on DeviantArt, you can follow me by going to daikaiju fanboy.deviantart.com if you want to follow me on DeviantArt. All right. And uh, if anybody's ever interested in talking about the book or have any questions, I'm always available on Facebook because I talk about writing to so many people on a daily basis that I got to tire out somebody else <laughs> with my rambling. <laughs> and this was, I think this has been a very overall productive interview. Yeah, it was a good talk. Thanks for having me on, Greg. Um, oh, it was my honor to have a book, to have a dinosaur book club for a change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd, be, well, well, I'd love to do, a, I'm definitely going to think about doing more of these where I interview authors of specific works like the Meg series or something else that I think is really important enough to warrant an episode discussing it. Oh, you definitely should. Uh, I'm sure you could get uh, Max Hawthorne on. He seems really active on Facebook. Yeah, I've tried, I've actually tried, Max has been involved with the podcast since the very beginning. He was helping out with the podcast since the very beginning, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, we actually had him on as a guest for one of our episodes we did on... We had a series of videos we did on marine reptile evolution, and we had him on as our guest for the Pliosaur episode. Oh, nice. We were well, if you ever do anything on Utah Raptor, let me know. <laughs> well, I have something planned for that terrifying predator. 
if I do Utah oh. Raptor, I plan on inviting Dr. Jim Kirkland on because he's one of the expert. He's the big name expert on this particular genus of dromaeosaur. Yeah, uh, wasn't he running the uh, Utah Raptor project that was going on? Uh, mm, yeah. Trying to raise money yeah, to uh, excavate. Yeah, he's still he's still on him. He's still trying to raise fund raise funding for that project. It's still trying. Ooh. It's going to be a while. They haven't hit all the funding that they need to actually get the block completely excavated just yet. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they'll hit me up and I can find a way to help them out. Uh, so, uh, yeah, anything more for me? Uh, only one more little quick thing here. One of my co-hosts is a cryptozoologist named Scott. He, had a, he was curious if you've read up on anything cryptozoology related that may have also inspired certain aspects of primitive war, for example. There is a there is a type of mythological or cryptozoological creature in Vietnam um, that was described as like shaking, taking children in the night. I don't remember what exactly the creature was, but it was supposedly inspired by the uh, large monitor lizards that live in Vietnam, and there were a lot of legends of large monitor lizards uh, killing children as well, because they have a specific breed down there, and don't remember which, but I think it gets up to like six feet long, but that's including the tail, which, you know, the tail is like half the length. But that's still a pretty big lizard, and definitely something you don't want attacking your toddler <laughs> in the middle of the night. You know, there was a particular account that I've read concerning a group of soldiers that allegedly had an encounter with, with a group of mysterious unknown hominids that they, some people have dubbed, you know, billy apes or rock throwing apes that took place during Ooh, the yeah, yeah. conflict. So, yeah, I actually, uh, somebody told me about that too. I read about that on the discussion group. Um, yeah, I had never even heard about that before writing the book. That would have been wild, though, being in the jungle and then having a gorilla hominid hop out of nowhere and toss a rock at you, as if it wasn't bad enough <laughs> being in Vietnam in that time period. So, yeah, I think that I think that's a pretty good place to end this discussion. I think. Ah, uh, cool. Well, thanks for having me on, Greg. It was an it was an honor to have you on, Ethan. And I look forward to having you on again for when the sequels come out. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I'm going to take off. Okay. Take care, Greg. Sure thing, Ethan. And for everyone listening, this is, once again, your host, Greg. This is Prehistory Traveler's Guide, signing off. <laughs>